One of the most important characters in all of Warhammer 40k is obviously the Emperor of Mankind, but can Games Workshop bring the Corpse Emperor back to a full-fledged either god or human warrior on the tabletop and within the lore? That's what we're going to explore in today's deep dive, starting off with a little bit of explanation as to why the resurrection of the Emperor could be happening right now. To understand how Games Workshop has already revealed the lore we need to know in order to understand how the Emperor of Mankind will become a god, we must go 60 million years in the past to the galactic conflict known as the War in Heaven. This galaxy-spanning struggle had many complex phases, with so much information that we can talk about it for hours. But the parts crucial to the Emperor's ascension to godhood are simple. In the beginning, there were two opposing sides, the Necron Tear, which were a short-lived species of humanoid that ruled over a fractured galactic empire, and the Old Ones, a psychically powerful species of reptilian humanoids with a unified galactic empire. The war in heaven began for a couple of reasons. The first was the Necron Tear's jealousy over the long lifespan of the Old Ones, who as far as they could tell, had cracked the code of aging and were essentially immortal. The second reason was that the ruler of the Necron Tear, known as the Silent King, was using the war as a way to unify the many dynasties of the Necron Tier. Alone the Necron Tier dynasties did not stand a chance against the Old Ones, because they possess a tremendous advantage. They created a system of warp tunnels, known now as the Webway, that allowed them to achieve faster than light travel. Severely outmaneuvered at almost every single battle zone, the Necron Tier had to ally themselves with a species of galactic parasites that fed on the sons of the galaxy. These godlike beings were known as the Catan. The bargain the Necron Tear and the Catan made is highly complex, and something we don't need to get into for the purpose of this video. What you do need to know is that out of the Alliance came the Necrons we know of today, and an arsenal of world-destroying weapons that tipped the scale of the war closer towards the Necrons. In response, the Old Ones used their superior knowledge of both psychic powers and biological engineering to create a series of warrior races to fight the Necrons. These warrior races were all psychically powerful, and under the leadership of the reptilian Old Ones, the warrior species numbered in the dozens, including the Krork, the Eldar, the Slan, the Hrud, the Jakaro, and possibly even humans. But the important warrior race to focus on is the Eldar. The Eldar race was unique in that it was far more psychically powerful than any of the other races. They seemed to be favored by the Old Ones, as they were taught how to harness their psychic powers and learned many of the secrets of the Old Ones. At this point, it's important to know that the Immaterium was not the chaotic demon-infested plane that it is in the 41st millennium. The warp was much calmer. There existed warp-born parasitic entities like the Enslavers, but the Chaos Guns did not have the same power that they do in today's day and age. This is why the Old Ones were able to create the Webway in the first place. While they were incredibly powerful psychers, the canvas in which they worked on was smoother than what it would become. The full detailed conclusion of the War in Heaven is also not important for the purpose of this video. What is important is that the psychic warrior races meant to destroy the Necrons were causing the Immaterium to become chaotic and dangerous because of the violence of the war. The growing psychic presence was also attracting warp parasites, known as the Enslavers, to invade real space in what would later become known as the Enslaver Plague. It was also important to recognize the bond that was developing between the Old Ones and the Eldar race. The Eldar knew that the immortal Old Ones were their designers. They had to have viewed their war against the Necrons as a war not just to defend themselves, but also a war to protect all life in the galaxy, a benevolent and honorable fight that was bestowed upon them by their creators and teachers. This can still be seen in the 41st millennium, as many craft worlds and exodite worlds stand vigil over Necron tomb worlds, always ready to fight their ancient rivals with more resolve than when fighting orcs or the Imperium. It's not hard to see how the Eldar might have viewed the Old Ones in the same manner as the Imperium viewing the Emperor of Mankind. Every reason the Imperium has to venerate the Emperor is shared with the ancient Eldar venerating the Old Ones. They both once walked amongst them as creators. The Emperor unified and created the Imperium of Man, and the Old Ones outright engineered the Eldar race. They both gave purpose and bestowed an honorable reason to wage war. The Emperor had the Great Crusade, and the Eldar had the War in Heaven. They both promised protection in life, 
with the old ones giving the Eldar the safety of the webway, and the Emperor giving the Imperium the Astronomicon. They both promise protection in death, with the old ones teaching the Eldar about the Spirit Stones, and the Emperor promising a spot in his army of the light once dead. They both even had written down fates. The Imperium had the Imperial Creed, and the Eldar had the Eldar mythology. It is in the mythology of the Eldar where the veneration of the Old Ones can be found. The Eldar worshipped a pantheon of gods that in the beginning walked amongst them, teaching them and leading them just like the Old Ones walked amongst the Eldar. The myth creates a story that one day, Liliath, the maiden goddess of dreams, dreamt that the Eldar would cause the destruction of Kayla Mencha Cain, the god of war. As Liliath was well known for her prophetic visions, Cain took it very seriously and resolved to wipe out the Eldar rays rather than letting them destroy him. The ensuing slaughter was of such proportion that Isha, the goddess of life, petitioned Azurian, the phoenix king and leader of the Eldari pantheon to have Cain stopped. Breaking this legend down from a secular viewpoint and with knowledge that the war in heaven was led by the old ones, it can be interpreted a little different. Perhaps Lilith, warning the war god Cain that he would be destroyed by the Eldar, was really a military strategist or council that foresaw the enslaver plague and warned Cain, who represented the military leader of the Old Ones. Cain's decision to destroy the Eldar might be interpreted as the rash decision to exterminate the warrior race in order to prevent the enslaver plague from destroying the Old Ones. Isha petitioning Asurian to stop Cain could be the head biological engineer who originally created the Eldar, petitioning the ruler or leader of the Old Ones to stop the extermination of the warrior race she gave life to. This gesture could have been seen as Isha showing love towards her creation and convincing Asurian that if they turned their guns on their warrior races, there would be no one left to fight the Necrons. The myth goes on to say that Asurian sided with Isha and created a barrier between the Eldari and their gods forever separating the two and decreeing that no god should intervene or communicate with the Aldari ever again, thus creating a barrier that separated the physical universe with the Immaterium. This could have been Asurian ordering the Old Ones into the webway in order to stay safe from the enslavers that were using their creations as portals into the material realm, thus keeping their people safe and leaving the warrior survival up to fate. Using the webway for protection is similar to what the Dark Eldar would do during the birth of Slanash. The myth then goes on to tell on how this was too much for Isha and her consort, Coronas, the god of the hunt. Isha and Coronas loved their children, the Eldari, and could not bear to separate from them. They approached Vol, the smith god, with their woes, and the kind Vol agreed to help them. With Vol's aid, they forged spirit stones from Isha's tears, through which mortal Eldari could communicate with the gods. With these stones, Isha and Coronas continued to teach and mentor their mortal children in secrecy. This can easily be seen as Isha and Coronas lamenting over abandoning their creations and defying Asurian's order by attempting to continue to help the Eldar in the war in heaven against the Necrons and the Enslavers. Vol is more likely one of the Old Ones' head engineers, also sympathetic to aiding the warrior races and assisting Isha in creating the Spirit Stones. With the Spirit Stones, the Old Ones gave the Eldar the gift of immortality, a defining feature of the ancient race. The legend goes on to say that one day Cain stumbled upon Isha and Coronas as they communicated with the Eldar and took the information straight to Asurian. Though Asurian was sympathetic with Isha and Coronas, they had broken his law, and he reluctantly decreed that the two gods would be given over to Cain to do with what he wished. This part of the myth could be showing how there were two sentiments as to the way the Eldar should be treated by the Old Ones. While Isha, Coronas, and Vol were interested in the Eldar survival, Cain and Asurian were not. Asurian allowing Cain to punish Isha and Coronas falls in line with what any empire would do when facing those that defied orders. But it also shows how Asurian had internal conflict as to the way the Eldar and the other warrior races were being treated during the Enslaver Plague. He understood that Isha and Coronis' actions had merit. If the Old Ones truly cared about preserving life to the point of going to war with the Necrons who wanted to end all life, then they shouldn't turn their backs on the Eldar. In the myth, Cain is allowed to torture Isha and Coronis in a burning pit until Vol, 
moved by their plight, struck a bargain with the war god to craft 100 enchanted swords, known as the Blades of All, for him in one year's time. In exchange, Cain promised to release his fellow gods from their prison in his realm. In reality, this shows you how Vol understood that Cain did not fully agree with Asurian's plan to pull back from the war in heaven, and by promising him the blades of Vol, he could convince him to free Isha and Kornas in exchange for support and the weapons to fight the Necrons and the enslavers. These blades are in fact the weapons similar to the Blackstone Fortresses that Abaddon would find scattered throughout the galaxy and then use them in his Black Crusades. We know this because of hints found in the Blackstone Fortresses themselves. It is said that Vol worked long and hard at his task and managed to forge all of the blades by the deadline except for one, which lay unfinished on his anvil. In order to trick Cain, Vol substituted the last blade with a mortal one he delivered to the war god who released his two captives. The three gods quickly departed, but Cain was quick to discover the trickery and cried out in rage. He called the smith god a cheat and vowed revenge. He immediately set off to track down Vol and make him pay. This shows how at this point, Isha, Coronis, and quite possibly even Vol did not care about continuing the war in heaven, whether because it was a war they had lost hope in or it was a war they believed could not be won. Either way, Vol's unfinished fortress was enough to cause Cain to pursue the three of them in the hopes of punishing them for lying about continuing the fight. It is said that Asurian himself never took a side, watching the carnage impassively, slowly coming to regret his hasty decision in sentencing Isha and Coronis to Cain's tender mercy. This again shows the internal conflict of Asurian as a leader. When faced with the Necron threat and the Enslaver Plague, Instead of finding a solution, his actions led to a civil war amongst his own people, and now he was going to add to that by not choosing a side. In the myth, Vol reforged the final sword, the one that he had failed to finish for Cain. The greatest of all, he called it Anaris. Armed with this weapon, Vol strode forth to do battle with Cain. It was a long, hard-fought struggle, but even with Anaris, Vol was no match for the war god. Cain cast down Vol, maiming the smith, and bound Vol to his own anvil. However, the falcon, consort of the great hawk, who had fought for Vol, took up the sword Anaris and delivered it to Eldanash, the greatest warrior and leader of the mortal Eldar. With Anaris in hand, Eldanash of the Red Moon took up the fight and faced Cain in single combat. Eldanash fought well, but in the end, he too was defeated by Cain, his body crushed by the god of war. As Cain slew Eldanesh, his hand began to drip with red blood. Forever after, he would become known as Kayla Mensha Cain, which means Cain, the bloody handed, in the Eldari lexicon. This shows the complete collapse of unity amongst the old ones. At this point, they were more interested in fighting each other than they were fighting any other threat. It also shows how the Eldar, for the first time, used their creator's weapons against them. The legend concludes that by this time, Asurian had had enough. He saw the slaughter and proclaimed the war in heaven over. Cain had gained his vengeance and left the field satisfied. We know now that the Old Ones eventually admitted defeat and left the galaxy. Just as Asurian called an end to the war in heaven, the Old Ones ended their war with the Necrons and left the warrior races alone. But the history of the war in heaven, from Isha's attempt to save the Eldar, to the epic rivalry between Vol and Cain, these stories were to be told and retold by the Eldar over and over again, and with every generation the tales of the war in heaven lost more and more facts and became more and more mythical, until the heroes of these now legends were not remembered as reptilian old ones but were instead described as ancient Eldar gods. A similar fate has befallen the Emperor of Mankind. He once walked amongst men as a powerful sorcerer with flawed goals now his story has become myth to the point where humanity sees him as a god but can't agree on an accurate depiction of what he looked like. Perhaps this is an unavoidable flaw in sentient beings. They want to create myths out of the lives of those that came before them, with each generation over embellishing the stories until they are no longer retellings of events but allegories barely connected to reality. But as we know, the Eldar race was so psychically powerful their beliefs and emotions were inadvertently taking shape in the Immaterium, just like they would give birth to Slanesh in the future 
the Eldar's belief in the god Isha, Cain, and the rest of the Eldari pantheon was made manifest sometime during their rise in power, which is why these gods are referred to as minor or lesser gods of chaos in the 40k lore. From Segra to the Avatar of Cain, all of these Eldar gods are the manifestation of the Eldari's idolization of the ancient Old Ones. And just as the religion of the Eldar created their own gods, the religion of humanity is creating the God Emperor. While humanity is not as psychically powerful as the Eldar, there are trillions more humans than Eldar, and their collective veneration of the Emperor is like a massive fire forging the God Emperor in the Immaterium. The more the belief grows, the faster the emotions coalesce in the war. It is the Imperial Creed, the religion created by Lorgar and spread by the Ecclesiarchy, that is turning the Emperor into a god of chaos. Now that's one explanation in theory as to how the Emperor could be resurrected, but what if the Imperium took that charge all on their own, starting with the Inquisition? Within the Inquisition, there have always been a core set of Inquisitors that believe that it is the duty of humanity to bring back the Emperor of Mankind to his full strength. In a sense, it is the Inquisition's role to revivify or resurrect the Emperor of Mankind so that he could step off his golden throne and lead humanity once more like he did in the Great Crusade. This is an old concept that has caused tension and infighting since the inception of the Inquisition, with the first schism arguing that humanity is too weak to even consider that their actions would affect such a powerful being like the Emperor, and that humans should simply wait for the Emperor to choose his return. But even faced with this opposition from Inquisitors and High Lords, there are countless Inquisitors who strive to bring back the Emperor of Mankind in one form or another. They are known as Resurrectionists, and dozens of cults and sects have formed around these ideals. Not all of them match up, and at times some Resurrectionist cults fight others, but each shares a common goal, the resurrection of the Emperor. And with that said, I want to welcome you guys back to another episode of 40 Facts About the 40k Universe. I am your host, Gersh1, and today we're going to be talking about a specific sect that is trying to resurrect the Emperor of Mankind in the current millennia of 40k. If you guys are new to the channel, subscribe. We post Warhammer 40k lore videos every single day. If you guys have any suggestions for topics that you guys would like us to talk about, please let me know what they are in the comment section below. And if you guys enjoy our content, thank our patrons on Patreon. It is because of them that we can do this. Link in the description if you guys want to support us. It's just a dollar a month. But with that said, let's get into 40 facts on the Casophilian Resurrection is called. The Casophilian Resurrectionist cult points to the miracles enacted by Saint Casophily as an example of how they can resurrect the Emperor of Mankind. Casophily was a simple missionary with the Missionarius Galaxia in the early 41st millennium. Their job was to spread the teachings of the Ecclesiarchy to the worlds in the southern reaches of the Segmentum Pacificus. It was on the world of Elena III that he discovered minions of the Dark Gods at the heart of several of the feral societies of the world, with few resources at hand. Kasafli did what he could to counter this endemic threat, and laid the foundation for a full Ecclesiarchy task force to continue his work later on. However, as he moved from settlement to settlement, preaching the word of the God Emperor, his foes began to take notice. Unable to bear such a threat to their power, the council of priests that ruled over the world moved against him and had him captured and tortured to recant on this belief that was new to the world. The chronicles of Casophily tell of his arduous ordeal at the hands of these twisted priests, to the point at which he died from his wounds. Here the tale of Saint Casophily would have ended, unknown and unrecorded, just like any other pious missionary whose life had ended in the pursuit of his calling. Though Casophily died at the hands of his tormentors, something remarkable happened. Five solar days after his death, the body of the missionary was to be burned upon a sacrificial pyre to the Dark Gods. As the flames took hold of the tattered wood, Casophily rose himself up and jumped from the fire. Miraculously brought back from the dead, Casophily confronted his tormentors and gathered the crowd. The story of St. Casophily's return spread quickly throughout the planet, and he led the people of Elena III against the priesthood. Such an occurrence would naturally attract the attention of resurrectionist inquisitors. The faction that has dedicated themselves to the study of Casophilus' story focuses on one particular aspect of the saint's tale. In his later works, Casophilus writes of his experience over the five solar days between death and resurrection. During this period, the saint tells of a bodiless floating sensation in a gulf of sound and color. He writes of a clamor of voices, some whispering and others bellowing, swirling around him. He speaks of a great light that suffused everything which he believed to be the Emperor of Mankind. And they also point to the fact that Casophilus' soul returned to his body 
validating the basic belief that psychic energy of an individual can pass from real space to the warp and then back into real space. But the most important part of the Casafilian resurrectionist ideology is the writings that tell of a place within the warp where souls reside. An account that validates the belief that the Emperor of Mankind is truly manifesting in the warp, and not only strengthening through his worship, but forming an army of the light. Knowing that demonic entities can breach the barriers between warp and real space, the Casophilians dedicate their study to the transition of a human soul to this universe. They are profound experts of demonology with regards to ritual summoning, as opposed to the accidental or malicious possession of a demon. And rather than the general and rather isolated studies of other resurrectionist factions, the Casophilians openly embrace new ideas of their theories and work closely with inquisitors of different learnings, gleaning what they can from the experiences of others. Where the Casophilians differ and where other inquisitors point out flaws is in their obsession with the realm that the soul goes to when it dies. Casophilians take reports of any afterlife very seriously. They will journey to planets where the population is dying, such as a world plagued by illness, and study any and all accounts of temporary death, always questioning the victims of their experience when their soul was given over to the Emperor. With this knowledge, they seek to devise a way to bring back the soul of a deceased man or woman, and if this proves successful, it will be a major step towards creating a means where the Emperor's soul can be brought back and placed into a suitable mortal form. Now those are my theories as to how the Emperor of Mankind could be resurrected. Let me know what you guys think in the comment section below. And if you have your own theories, also let me know in the comment section below. If you guys enjoyed this video, hit the thumbs up button. Don't forget to subscribe and share this video with your friends. And I'll talk to you guys tomorrow. This was Gersh1 with One Mind Syndicate signing out.